Hello there, and uh, my name is Susie Simpson, and uh, I'm uh, a member of the BHS um, British Herpetological Society Council. And I'm joined with Trevor Rose, who's also on council. And we're going to talk to you a little bit about reptiles in the UK. So um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about. Oh, why is it? There we go. Um, so native species in the UK. So what does native mean? Well, native actually means that they originate from this area. So they actually originate in the UK. And that means that they weren't actually put there by humans. So um, species such as common lizards, slow worms, grass snakes, adders, smooth snakes and sand lizards are all reptiles that actually originate here in the UK. And so they weren't actually put here necessarily by humans, they actually originate here. So, um, and these species you may have heard of, and additionally, we actually have UK laws which protect these species. So that means that um, there are laws in place to uh, stop them from being sold or traded or injured or even killed. So we like to look after our species here in the UK. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit, bit about each of those reptiles here. Um, so this is the grass snake, absolutely beautiful. If you see here, um, these pictures show you that this snake has uh, a yellow and black collar around the neck and that's how we tend to identify them. And they also have markings that can be mistaken for adders actually. Some people will call us at the rescue centre and they will say that they have an adder in their house when in actual fact it's probably a grass snake. Um, so these guys have uh, a circular pupil. So if you take a look at the eye, you can actually see this circular pupil up here. And um, they're normally found around throughout the UK and Wales and in wetland areas. These guys love to hang out near ponds and go for a swim. Um, and this also means that they like to eat things like fish and uh, amphibians. They tend to live around 15 to 25 years. So a lot of our reptiles are long lived creatures and they are non venomous. So they, um, uh, they are a uh, constrictor species. So cool facts about the grass snake, if threatened, they um, tend to pretend to be dead. So as you can see in the picture below, we've actually got a grass snake pretending to be dead. And this is a good defense because if anything's trying to attack them, then they tend to just play dead and hopefully they'll get left alone. But they also do something that a lot of snakes will do, they'll musk. And that's, that means that they give off this smelly odor that basically says, leave me alone. And this tends to be pretty um, effective in um, getting away from predators. Then we have our adders, and these are absolutely beautiful. Um, adders get a bit of a poor rap, um, but they are absolutely incredible. If you look at the patterns on them, um, they tend to have this amazing zigzag pattern that runs down the back. And um, they tend to, uh, are different in different colors. So we get this different coloration with the males and the females. And in the bottom picture, you can see a male that's a, a lot paler and grayer. Um, and we have female with this dark brown zigzag. So the females can be brown with a sort of dark brown zigzag down the back. And they also have what we call keeled scales. So if you look at the top picture, we actually have these ridges that run along each of the scales. And this is uh, something that, that you can see with various different snakes, but the adder actually have, has these peeled scales. So they're quite small. You wouldn't expect them to be as small as they are. I certainly was surprised when I saw one, um, but they're still quite a stocky um, little snake. So they're still in body size, they're quite stocky. And these are different to our um, smooth snakes and our grass snakes. They actually have this vertical pupil um, so you can see this slit in the eye. And so this is another identifying factor with um, adders. They're usually found throughout the UK, in woodlands, moorlands and heathlands, and they tend to live sort of five to 10 years. And they tend to eat things like frogs and lizards and newts and small mammals. So animals like mice and voles and birds. So their diet's quite um, varied in that respect. Now, these are our only venomous um, snake here in the UK. 
So this is one of the factors that most people um, associate with adders. But there is a cool fact about adders. We actually do, they do a dance. Um, so when it comes to springtime, they like to dance. They go and compete with other males and they tend to do this kind of rapping dance um, in order to compete. So what I'm gonna do, I'm just going to show you a short video. So as you can see here, these two males are actually wrapping themselves around each other and they're doing a kind of dance. And so what's happening is that they're showing each other how strong they are. And by doing that, hopefully they outcompete the other male and they're able to get access to females. So it's a wonderful thing to see, something that the adders do. Um, so if you're able to see this, it's absolutely wonderful sight. Right, so I'll take you back to my other screen. So the next snake is the smooth snake. So this is the UK's rarest reptile. And they tend to average around 50 to centimeter, uh, 70 centimeters in length. So if you imagine a ruler is about 30 centimeters, then you can imagine that these snakes can get up to two or just over two centimeters, two ruler lengths. Um, they are sexually dimorphic, which means they are different in size if they're females or males. So the females tend to be larger than the males. As you can see here, you look at these kind of mottled patterns on the body and they actually look similar to a grass snake, but they don't have that really distinct yellow collar around the neck. And they tend to be found in the far southerly regions of the UK, so we find them more down south. And they can live up to sort of 20 years. And they also eat things like sand lizards, slow worms and insects. So uh, they tend to live alongside the sand, uh, sand lizards, but they do also um, have them as part of their diet. And again, this is another snake that's non-venomous like our grass snake. So a cool fact about the smooth snakes is that they incubate eggs inside them. So the eggs actually keep going inside the body. And then when they're ready to hatch out, they hatch out and they come out of the snake as live young. So they actually look like mini smooth snakes when they come out, which is very cool. So this is one of my favorites, the slow worms. So is it a worm? Well, I'd say not. Is it a snake? No, it's not a snake either. It's actually a lizard. So it's a legless lizard. As you can see by our picture here, you can see there's no, there's no legs on this uh, animal, but they do have blinking eyelids and they have ear openings. So that tends to identify as a lizard. So if you think about a leopard gecko, they have um, ear openings and they also have blinking eyelids. So these little guys tend to be around 40 to 50 centimetres in length and they're small and smooth and brown. And the females are much bigger than the males, but the males can actually have these really wonderful blue spots down the side of them. So that's absolutely fascinating if you see a slow worm, a male slow worm with blue spots. They're found throughout the UK in grassland, moorland and heathland, and they average about 15 to 20 years. But they has been a record of 54 years old, which is absolutely incredible. Um, they will eat things like invertebrates. So they love to slurp up a few slugs, snails, spiders, and earthworms. So that's a, a, nothing like a preference for them, but maybe not so much for everybody else. Um, and these little guys, if they're attacked, they actually shed their tail. So they can actually drop part of their tail in order to distract whatever's trying to attack them. But the great thing about this is it does actually grow back. The only thing is once it grows back, it doesn't actually detach the next time. So very cool fact about our slow worms and dropping their tail. Um, the common lizard. Now this little lizard, so this is a female here. She's got these brown side patterns and the long line down the back. Um, and they're very curious little creatures. Um, 
They are, they do tend to be found in most places in the UK. They're commonly seen in variations of brown, but can vary greatly in their coloration. And they're around about 10 to 15 centimeters long. So they're about half a ruler length. Um, but they are quite small, you know, trying to find them, you have to really look a little bit harder. As you can see in the picture, this female sitting on a leaf um, in the dappled sunlight and so would be quite hard to see if you weren't sort of staying still, listening, listening to the rustling of the leaves in order to see where they are. So they're just trying to do some cryptic basking and get some sun. They're found throughout the UK in Wales and grass, grasslands, moorlands and heathlands. And they tend to live probably about five to six years. And these little guys will eat things like spiders and grasshoppers and flies. And I've, I must admit, when I've been out surveying, I've seen these little guys hunting for flies. So cool fact about the common lizard, they can drop their tail too. So they're a lizard just like the slow worms, but theirs um, can, theirs can grow, regrow just a bit shorter. So if you can bear, I don't know if you can see in this picture, but actually this lizard has actually lost its tail. So you can see here the end of the tail. Um, so it can regrow a bit, but it will just be a little bit shorter. And with a lot of lizards, the pattern is nowhere near as um, striking as when it's first grown. So these are our common lizards. And this is another one of our rare reptiles in the UK. So this is the UK's rarest lizard. And these are sand lizards. Now, the males are absolutely beautiful in spring. As you see, the top right picture actually shows you this wonderful coloration, green coloration. The females tend to be brown um, with dark blotches along their back. And obviously the males are quite different. And if you see down in the bottom picture, that's actually a young juvenile um, sand lizard there. They're restricted to a few southerly areas of the UK, same as the smooth snake, they're um, down in the south and they can live up to 20 years. And they are quite different. They like to eat fruit and flower heads, but they also like to eat slugs and spiders. And that seems to be something on quite a few of the reptiles menus we're talking about. So cool facts about the sand lizard. Sand lizards like to dig their own burrows. So these can actually be around a meter in depth. So they can actually dig quite far down. And as you can see in the top picture, this is a hole with a 2P next to it. So you can see what kind of size we're looking at. They're also um, the only egg laying native lizards in the UK as well. So now we've talked about reptiles here in the UK, how do you think you might be able to help? Well, Citizen science is a really great way for people to get involved. And this basically means that you as the general public can actually take part in some wonderful projects that are being run by organisations and groups. And citizen science is about contributing to the research that's being done. And the great thing about that is that you can get outside and you can help to further all of this science. And you don't have to be an expert or a scientist to take part. And that's great because everyone can get involved in it. But I'm sure you're saying, well, why should I get involved? Well, it does benefit you actually. You know, you get to take part in an active, um, active science project. You know, you get to take part actively in these kind of things and contribute to projects. And the more of us that do it, the more it helps to make decisions to conserve our native species. The more data and more information we gather, the more information you send us, the more we're able to help these native species. It can also help improve your reading and your math and writing skills too. So if you take your pen and paper and you go outside and you write down how many animals that you've seen, where you've seen them, the time of day, the temperature even, any of that kind of information can be shared with us, but you're also improving all of those kind of skills. But by getting involved, more importantly, you understand more about the world around you and the animals and plants you're surrounded by. It's great to get out into nature and actually see where you live and your countryside because, and the animals that actually live in that countryside. So it's, it's good for that full understanding of your environment. And you've probably actually taken part in citizen science previously and you didn't even realize it. There are lots and lots of uh, projects going on and some you might have seen on the television 
Um, we've got the British Trust for Ornithology, so that's BTO, um, their Garden Bird Watch. We have the Woodlands Trust Nature's Calendar. We also have the Big Butterfly Count. I know before I've counted um, snails and identified snails in my garden. And we also have some really cool apps available. So you can go online uh, on your phone and you can download things like the iRecord app or the iNaturalist app. And these are great for submitting sightings. If you're out and about, then you can just go online and you can actually send them in that way. So just a little bit on a couple of projects. So this is one, uh, these are a couple by the Ark Trust and that's um, the first one up here is the Reptile Gene Bank. So um, what you can do is actually while you're out and about, if you come across what we call a slough, uh, which is actually shed skin by the snake. So what happens, reptiles will shed their skin and it will come off a bit like a sock. So say this adder here will shed their skin and it will come off the whole of the body in one long sock. And this is actually used to analyze DNA from the shed skin. Um, and they're carrying out research with, with regards to that. And so what you can do is actually, if you find anything like this, you can take it home, you can make sure you keep it dry and don't put it in sunlight. And then you can go online to the Ark Trust and you can actually post um, to their gene bank. Another project that they have is the Garden Dragon Watch. So you can go out into your garden for 10 minutes and just have a look, see what you can find out there and write it all down. So you can record the habitat and what animals you saw and you can go online and complete a form. And it really is that easy, but it's something all of the family can do in order to take part and contribute data to these uh, research projects. Another one is the Sith project, which is snakes in the heather. And this is a smooth snake project. So this is um, looking, it's basically looking to conserve reptiles, raise awareness of conservation uh, needs of heathland habitats and reptiles. It's also promoting better understanding and they want to build those community relationships with people. And that's by getting you involved and getting you out there and, and helping out and basically getting the reptile survey volunteers to help them by doing surveys and collecting data. And the data can be not just on smooth snakes, but it's also adders and grass snakes. And the great thing about getting out and being out looking for animals is that you might see other animals that you weren't originally out there for. And so you can always write that down and you can send it in. So any data is great data. So I'm going to hand you over to Trevor, who's going to talk to you about amphibians in drains. Thank you very much, Susie. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much for that. Um, so today we're talking mostly about reptiles and citizen science in reptiles, but British Herpetological Society, the BHS, uh, we're also interested in, in amphibians too. So just as a little breakout, I want to talk to you about um, a project that we've been working on for the last few years, and particularly the citizen science behind it, and, and how you can get involved too. So, this is a drain that you might typically find beside uh, any road, and um, quite often it's called a gully pot, so we call them gully pots, but we'll call them drains for today. Um, and all sorts of things get stuck down drains, you find leaves and twigs and litter, you might drop your keys down there, you might lose money or even your wedding ring. Um, but did you know that small animals could get stuck in too? And amphibians in particular are uh, um, much at risk from these. <clears throat> Our common toad is particularly vulnerable, and, and we'll come to the reasons why for that. And common frog also, you think that they're quite agile. And, and they should be able to avoid trains, but they still get stuck. Our two small newts, the palmate and the smooth newt, they fall in. And even our lovely great crested newt, our rarest newt, um, which is a big, bold, robust animal, uh, they're vulnerable too, and, they, and we find them in drains. <clears throat> and if they fall in, uh, they can't scale the walls to climb back out again. And this is where the problem is for them. And we can have hundreds of of these falling into drains in one small area. And once they get in, they just can't get back out again. 
So across the year, we might lose many thousands of amphibians in this way. And other animals can become trapped too. Um, mice and voles and invertebrates such as beetles and even lizards and snakes. And we've even found in some places um, birds and squirrels and even bats. Um, you hardly believe what can get caught in the drain. But once they fall in, as I say, there's just no escape for them. So why does it happen? And why in such great numbers? Well, amphibians are particularly vulnerable in the spring um, because they need to migrate back to their, their natal ponds to breed, the place where they were born. And they might travel long distances to get there. And quite often it takes them across roads, such as the one you see here. And this is quite a typical scenario. We've got quite a new housing estate um, in front of us and to the right hand side, there's lots of new houses with gardens. And beyond that, there's countryside and woodland. And to the left of this picture, there's a pond where the uh, amphibians all want to breed. And in the spring, they leave their hibernation places. And quite often these are in these gardens uh, and, and they head, head for the, uh, the lake. And here's Mr. and Mrs. Toad trying to get to the lake. Um, they come to the curb on the other side of the road and they don't know what to do. And eventually they'll, they'll end up next to a drain and sadly they'll fall in. And where this happens, it often happens, uh, sorry, in, in places where, where this happens, it's often known to us. Um, and we know they cross the road in large numbers. And where that happens, we can um, have these registered as proper crossing sites. And uh, you can do that with um, a, a frog life register. Uh, and with their permission, we can then get signage for the roads, which slow people down to stop the, stop the amphibians getting squashed. And it also means we can have toad patrols. And here's a group of people uh, going out after dark with their torches in their buckets, picking up the toads. And, and this can be part of a citizen science project for you. You can join the toad patrol and you can record the numbers of toads rescued. You could maybe even join, uh, maybe even organize a new toad patrol um, if you know a place like this where you see lots of amphibians crossing, but nobody maybe knows about it too much yet. Um, and this is great for preventing toads from getting squashed by cars, of course. But what about the amphibians which cross the road on their own when no one's around? <clears throat> As we saw before, the animals, um, the amphibians don't know what to do when they come to a curb. And they might, they might try to scramble up, but they just can't get a grip. And, so, and especially when they're particularly small like this one, they just can't get up the curb. And they, so they tend to follow the curb along to a, and they come to a drain. That's the time when they when they're in danger and they fall in. So as, as a young citizen scientist, what can you do? Well, the first thing we can do is find your dangerous drains, find where the biggest problems are. So you could, you could be checking drains near your school or your home just to see if there are amphibians trapped there. Um, you might need a strong torch to look down the dark hole. It's quite difficult to see in, an, in a drain in the daylight, but a good torch will help you but don't try to lift the cover, just, just peering through the top. And you can count what you see and record your findings. Um, and amphibians only normally survive in a drain for a few days um, before they unfortunately die. So if you check weekly, you can be sure that each time you check, any new amphibians that you find are probably, have probably only just fallen in in the last few days. But do remember, roads are dangerous places for humans to be too. So make sure you wear high visibility vests, maybe take an adult with you, or, or, and certainly work from the pavement, don't step onto the road. And so what can we do to help the amphibians that fall into drains? <clears throat> well, one great thing is that amphibians have pentadactyl digits, and that's a scientific way of saying that they've got fingers and toes that move like ours. So that means uh, they can grip and grasp things just as we do. So, uh, so what we can do is give them a ladder to climb back out. Um, and our ladders are, are a metal frame, so they're nice and strong. And they've got a special plastic mesh to make it easy for the amphibians to hold on to. And it just stands inside the gully pot, just like a, a ladder would against a wall. No fixings at all. And, and it doesn't prevent the drain from doing the job that it's supposed to do, which is obviously take rainwater, rainwater away. That's obviously very important that it doesn't get blocked. 
And I'm going to attempt to sorry. <clears throat> just going to show you a quick video and this was this was filmed in the Netherlands by a group called Ravon and they've done a lot of conservation um, projects uh, in the Netherlands and they've done some great work on ladders and it's very with their very kind permission that I'm able to show you this and this was from a few years ago when they did some initial trials and you can see that uh, ladders of different types are actually quite effective. This is actually, it looks like the same frog, but this is actually two frogs coming out and heading off in the same direction. Um, and so, and, and it was the work that, um, the work that uh, Ravon did, which inspired us to create the ladders at the BHS. And we, we've already got hundreds of ladders all across the UK. Um, <clears throat> And we've across 90 different sites, and we've probably installed nearly 2,000 ladders now at those 90 sites. Some of them are actually in Sussex and actually quite near Eastbourne. Uh, but we do need many, many more. We work across the UK, and there are millions of drains out there. And every year they catch amphibians. And so every year we have fewer and fewer amphibians left. So we have to try to conserve them. And with a ladder, amphibians can help themselves. They instinctively climb to safety, and they're always they're always very happy to to fall into drains where we where we've already installed a ladder. They can, they climb out surprisingly quickly. And if you look very carefully at the centre of the picture on the right, you'll say that Mr. and Mrs. Toad. You'll see them that Mr. and Mrs. Toad that fell down the drain earlier. They're actually making their way back to the surface on the ladder. <clears throat> and how can you make a, a difference? So. In summary, you can check your, check your drains, do it safely, and record your findings. If you do find amphibians in drains, you can tell your local amphibian and reptile group. I'm sure they would love to be involved. Or you can report it to your local environmental or biodiversity officer. Who you can make contact through the local camp. You can just contact us at the HS and we'll put you on the right path. And our contact details are obviously on our website. You can actually make a, pro a school project out of it. Um, you can get some great data from doing projects like this. And you can do all sorts of things with that data. And if you need a few pointers, we did a study paper a few years ago, which you could base your project on. And if you want a link to that, um, please do feel free to contact us. We'll, we'll share that with you. And then you can be helping the toad out of a hole. And with that, I'm going to hand back to Susie. And she's going to tell you some more brilliant citizen science ideas. Thank you, Trevor. Right, OK. So. There we go. So we've talked a lot about native species. So what we're going to do now, I'm going to talk about non-native species. So I've put here, sorry, are you lost? Because in actual fact, they probably are a little bit. Um, they don't tend to, non-native species don't tend to come from this country. So unlike native species, native species are originally from here. Whereas non-native species tend to be ones that have been introduced and that's usually by humans somehow. So animals such as wall lizards, green lizards, red-eared sliders, yellow-bellied sliders, and much, much more actually find their way into the UK. And they can get here in different ways. So here on the right hand side, you can see a red-eared slider. Um, and actually a lot of people keep red-eared sliders and other slider terrapins as uh, pets. And so sometimes they might escape um, or they may even be released out into the countryside, um, which is just to note is not allowed. You're not to release anything into the UK countryside. Um, but we also find that animals get introduced through shipments um, so, and uh, sort of shipments that come in and we find animals that have um, come from another country who actually mistakenly end up in the products. Um, so we see people buying bananas and all sorts of fruit from shops and finding animals in there, geckos and things like that. Um, and also people have come over with suitcases that 
an animal has or a snake has just happened to get into their suitcase when they were on holiday and they didn't realize and they came back and and out it came when they started to unpack all of their stuff so there are several ways in which these animals can actually end up here so why is it important that we know um, about these non-native species? Well, the thing is that they can actually harm our native species. So the ones that originally come from here can actually um, be harmed by them. And this can be for multiple reasons. So they, it could be that they're competing for food. So um, they might have the same food source. So they might be after the same food and having these animals there, they might take it from them. Or it could be their space, you know, where they are, where they sit, where they bask, any of these kind of things. But non-natives can also damage the habitat and they can also bring diseases and parasites and they can pass it to our native species. So um, the project that I actually uh, work on is um, about turtles and uh, we actually the background to this is where we've had turtles found in the UK water bodies and this we can put down to um, a time where our terrapins were quite popular to keep they're quite cheap they were quite small as young turtles they can be about the size of a 50p piece and due to popularity from programs and movies and things like that people could easily buy these and keep them in a small tub the only issue here is that actually these animals get quite big once they get to adult size. And the problem is trying to keep one as a pet can be a little more difficult because you need a bit more space for them and water, obviously. So what I wanted to do um, with my Turtle Tally team is basically start a project that focused on gathering um, observations. So sightings of these turtles in our lakes and ponds. And we do this with Hadlow College and the British Ethnological Society and the NCRW and a lot of other people who have got on board. And all we're doing is basically asking for the general public, so yourselves, to go out and look for these released pet turtles. So we're trying to raise awareness, we're trying to educate people on keeping terrapins. We're also trying to add to all the stuff we already know. So we already have locations for some of these turtles over the years um, but we want to add to that and we want to focus a bit more on it and get more information um, but we also want to understand where they are so um, and whether they are affecting um, the environment or um, how are they doing are that is their welfare you know are they healthy so what can you do to help us out well you could spot a turtle so this is a picture from Sarah Passarelli, who basically saw a turtle out on a basking log, basking on a log out in her local lake. And she was out for a walk, obviously, like everybody else is doing, going out for a walk and spotted this turtle out on this log. Now, it would be quite hard to see them because they can blend in quite easy, as you can see, unless I put the red circle around, you may not have been able to spot it. And this is what we're looking to do. So what you can do is head out and go and look for turtles in local lakes and ponds. And then you can head on to uh, our website and you can fill out our easy questionnaire and basically tick some boxes, identify the turtle if you can, upload some photographs and some information. And then that's basically it. So it's really easy to do. And once you do this, you become a tally pal because you're helping us out. So you're part of the tally team now. And this is great that you can get outside and you can get some fresh air, get some exercise and spend some family time too, if you wanna go out with friends or family. And it's just a great way to get some fresh air and look for turtles and have fun. And the best time of year to do this is probably between March and October because turtles tend to hibernate so what they'll do is they'll disappear over the winter months hunker down and then they'll come back out in the March time and we'll start seeing them coming out to bask on logs again so this is probably the best time for you to go out and have a look please make sure you're with a grown-up uh, a responsible adult if you're little and make sure you stay safely away from the water's edge so there are uh, risks to being around water so just make sure you're being extra safe
and make sure you're uploading your sightings to the Hadlow College webpage, or you can now go to our new website at www.turtletally.co.uk. And just a note on this, there's no touching of turtles. So um, we do not want anybody to be disturbing the turtles or handling them. It is just an observational study. So it's just about looking for them and writing down where you see them. And please make sure you stick to government COVID-19 guidelines with regards to safety. Make sure that you're just being careful and keeping safe. So just to show you what we learned from the last year, this year we actually found, you can see all these orange dots on, on the UK map, and you can see this is where all the turtles were that we got recordings for. And if you see, there is a turtle that's actually up in Scotland, um, but we also have a turtle down in Cornwall, down near Falmouth. So they're all over the place. So I would get outside and see if you can find one. You may not think there's one nearby, but I guarantee you probably will see one. So they're mostly red-eared sliders, which is what my little friend up here on the left-hand side is with that big striking red um, stripe down the side of the head. But we also get some odd um, turtles that get released as well that you probably wouldn't expect to see. And three of our sightings have been soft shell turtles this year. And if you don't know what a soft shell turtle is, I'm going to show you. And this is a soft shell. So these are absolutely amazing creatures and they're quite big and they've got that pointy nose as well. So actually, when you see them in the distance, um, they look quite odd, but um, and they certainly have a distinct silhouette. But these are absolutely incredible creatures, but you may see um, something other than those red-eared sliders out on logs. So what I'd like to say is basically thank you and good luck with your citizen science project, whatever you decide to um, take part in, any contribution is always welcomed by anyone um, running their research projects. So do get involved. And also if you're crazy about reptiles like we are then, and you're aged between five and 17, you can sign up to our Young Herpetologist membership for free. So you can actually get that free membership and everything that comes with it, um, which is absolutely great. Um, you can take a look at our membership page on the BHS website and you can click on uh, the links there and you can download a form to fill out in order to gain that Young Herpetologist membership. Okay, so what we're gonna do now is we're gonna take a look at the chat. We're gonna see what questions we've got here. So, uh, adders, such a short lifespan, is that only in the UK or anywhere? Well, that's, that's everywhere, isn't it, Trevor? Oh, your, your sound needs to go on, Trevor. <laughs> I beg your pardon. There we go. <laughs> uh, yeah, sa sadly, all reptiles are actually quite low on the food chain, so most of them don't die from old age. They die from predation. Um, and so if, a, if an adder lives to 10 years, it's actually doing very, very well. Susie mentioned the slow worms with blue spots. Actually, a blue spotted slow worm is a sign of age in males, and they don't usually get their spots till they're about 15 or 20 years old. So if you find a blue spot, it's lower and you're doing very well. So, the, so those, um, those lifespans that Susie gave you are across the species, depend, regardless of where they're from. Um, okay, so can you get slow worms or lizards in back gardens or do they need a larger space? Well, I certainly know a lot of friends who've got slow worms in their back gardens, um, definitely under the patio. Um, they absolutely love to hide under there um, and sort of near the compost heap and things like that. So I've definitely got friends who've got them in their back gardens. How about you, Trevor? Uh, we do, but the thing about um, reptiles in, in gardens, really, the key thing is connectivity. So if you live near a place where, there's, where you've already got reptiles, then you can encourage them into your garden if they're just nearby. But unfortunately, if, they're, if the nearest population is too far away, it might be very difficult to actually encourage them to come. So I do know people that are lucky enough to have common lizards and slow worms in their gardens, but most of those are in quite, quite rural places. You wouldn't normally find them in town centres, for example. It's usually in, in 
quite urban areas. It's funny actually, because one of my friends, she lives in um, quite a built up part in Tunbridge and she gets them in her back garden. You would not expect it, certainly not as like, like you say, very rural areas, I would expect it a lot more, but yeah, absolutely. Uh, what are those lizards that run around on walls in France? They'd be our so. European wall lizards. <laughs> yeah, I, I would think so. <laughs> There's yeah. quite a few different species, but they'll be one of the wall lizard types. Yeah, absolutely. Um, why are smooth snakes and lizards uh, ranges so restricted? Uh, what do they need and how can current practices be improved? So, um, I mean, well, obviously habitat issues, um, you know, the usual degradation of areas, building build, built up areas. Um, I mean, climatic changes, Trevor, would you say, or? That might have, that's maybe something to do with it, but mo mostly it is about um, habitat fragmentation, unfortunately. Um, it's, it's all these anthropomorphic, um, uh, anthropological, I should say, effects on on the on our on our planet that we that we impose on it which basically means anything to do with humans is going to upset them and mostly it's about urbanization and expanding development and you know lots of habitat being lost to new developments and that fragments of populations um, and sand lizards and smooth snakes are very very specific in, in terms of the habitat they need so the uh, heathland and and moorland that they that, uh, that they really uh, frequent are the kind of places which are the first to be developed. Or if it's on, the, if it's what we used to call green belt, that seems to be a, an, an old-fashioned term nowadays. There's no such thing as green belt anymore. But the places which are close to towns, which which gradually get built on and expanded on. Okay, so um, they're also asking how can current practices be improved? So I mean, a lot of there is a lot of um, work on sort of you know, making better areas for reptiles and sort of, you know, improving habitat and, you know, things like log piles and all these kind of things. There are practices in place in order to improve the habitat and provide areas for them. Is there anything else you can think of, Trevor? That... No, well, it's, and, and legislation too. I mean, there's, there are, there are legisla legis legislation in place which um, uh, helps to protect countryside. Um, but it really needs to be properly enforced and so you have to have, there's lots of things you need to do before you can create a new development and uh, it has to go through lots of planning procedures and we really need to bolster those procedures with much uh, with much stronger practices I think and um, uh, and and replace habitat where we can um, that's that's one thing we try to do but we can't possibly do it on a big enough scale I don't think to to counteract the the uh, there's a, there's, a, there's a bigger imbalance in terms of what we're building and what we're what we're reconstructing for for wildlife, unfortunately. Uh, but I think that's that's what it's mostly about: is strong legislation and replacement habitat. Okay, so another question we've got: Do frogs fall down drains all year round? Mm, I, I saw that one, uh, and they do. All, all amphibians can fall down drains at any time of year when they're when they're roaming around looking for food and foraging. Uh, they could fall down at any time. Um, we tend to see a peak in the springtime because of the migration that I mentioned. Uh, so when they're crossed, they come out in, in big numbers in the early spring and they all go to the, to the pond in one go. Um, so that's when we see a, a, big peak, a big spike in numbers of amphibians falling down drains. But after that spike, yeah, sure, they, can, they walk around, they fall down drains. We sometimes see another, another spike in, in the late summer when all the uh, younger emerging from the pond and they're starting to distribute away from the pond and then they fall in drains as well. So it can happen at any time when the frogs are active and, and newts and toads as well. Yeah. So they're also asking, where can I get a toad ladder? From the BHS. <laughs> 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 you, need to, uh, you need to contact me personally. My, my email address is on the website and it's easy to remember, secretary at the bhs.org. Um, contact me and I'll help you. Oh, I think we've lost the there we go. Uh, you need for council. Um, your, your local authorities need to approve the use of them as well. So there's a little bit of red tape to go through, but we can help you with that. 
Brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Um, okay, so somebody else is asking about what should I look for to see if I have slow worms in my garden? What do they need as a place to live? Uh, so again, like we were saying about, you know, rural areas mainly, but um, but you, I, I, from my personal point of view, I know I've um, patios and rockeries and, you know, the reptiles like to come out and bask. So, um, and rocks hold a lot of heat in the sun. So basically they get that heat on their belly, but they also get the sun coming down. It's just the best place to sit. So, um, you know, for any of your reptiles, if you're, the other question is, is there a way to encourage snakes and, rep, um, and snakes and amphibians into a garden? Um, so those kind of things are considerations. Think about what they might like to sit out on. Um, and you do get these cryptic baskers who sort of have doubled sunlight. So don't think they just will haul out in the middle of full sun. But um, things like rocks, you know, places they can pull out, you know, pull out on um, and get some basking rays in that kind of morning time to heat up so that they get optimal temperatures and they're able to start um, looking around for things to eat. Um, but like I say about habitat changes, so encouraging snakes and amphibians, I say there's lots of different ways you can do that. I think a couple of other talks have talked about ponds, building ponds in your garden, small ones, big ones. Um, but you can also things like log piles and things like that you can provide in your garden. Um, there's quite a lot online about um, doing that. So you, there's loads of resources online that you can find as well. Yeah, maybe I could just add as well. If your garden's big enough and you can afford to do it, just leave a leave a, a portion of the garden fairly wild and try not to uh, try not to uh, manicure it too much. Just literally let it grow wild. And um, if it's in a sunny spot and you put down a piece of corrugated iron or just a piece of roofing felt or even a piece of carpet. Um, not too big, a couple of feet square, uh, about 50 centimetres square. Just press that down into the vegetation and just leave it permanently and lift it up occasionally. That's how you might find if you've got slow worms or not, because if, you, if, you, if they are there, those are the places they like to hide. And a compost heap as well. If you've got a compost heap, uh, put a piece of roof and felt on the top of it. And um, grass snakes especially love to go under there. And uh, if you're lucky enough, you might even get snakes laying their eggs in your compost heap if they're, if they're around and having a pond is a brilliant idea a pond will a pond a pond will bring in amphibians and amphibians will bring in grass snakes for sure 